I found a fun list this week, the dumbest research studies of 2016. One of those studies found, quote, a healthy diet helps you live longer. <laughs> Proved by science. Another discovered most of your Facebook friends aren't really your friends, okay? But my favorite by a long shot was, and this is a real study, Spider-Man doesn't exist. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I should have spoiler alerted that one, but researchers at Cambridge University, you know, we feel, you know, we, we hear some of these names and we feel like intimidated Harvard and Stanford and Oxford and Cambridge. Now listen to Cambridge University spent money and time conclusively determining that it is, quote, virtually impossible for a normal-sized human being to have the characteristics of Spider-Man. So you're saying there's a chance, is what. <laughs> Those are dumb research studies. Tonight, the teacher in Ecclesiastes invites us into his lab where he has been running incredibly important experiments for a lifetime. As researchers often do, he gives us the abstract up front. Hevel, hevel, everything is hevel. His work uh, hasn't left him feeling like he decided something conclusive. No, we find that his work has left him frustrated and still full of questions. Now, his research project wasn't dumb like those listed above, but he was asking the questions that every human being wrestles with at some point or another. In fact, this is maybe the most needful human study ever conducted. And his problem wasn't that he was out of his depth. It wasn't that he wasn't qualified in order to, to find the answers that he needed. In our verses tonight, the teacher is going to give us his credentials. And he reveals his methodology showing the impeccable quality of his research. He's not just a hobbyist trying to divert himself. He's capable, he's well-funded, fully qualified. And on top of that, he's driven by desperation. Like all people, he has a deep need for meaning and purpose. And to his credit, he's unwilling to simply ignore the problem festering in his heart. This problem, this need for meaning, this need for wholeness, this need for purpose. He doesn't just try to distract himself out of, out of thinking about it. He doesn't try to just ignore it. He doesn't try to just mute it down and hope it goes away. No, he, he faces it head on. He dedicated his life to finding the meaning of life. But what he found is that these answers elude human beings uh, like smoke in the wind. So we begin in verse 12, and he says, I, the teacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem. So as we've pointed out a couple times before, Ecclesiastes never specifically names Solomon as the writer, though it's obvious that the book wants us to assume that it is Solomon speaking. Uh, and as I've said before, many modern commentaries say, well, it's, in that case, it's definitely not Solomon. Uh, and they assume that it is some anonymous later writer after the Babylonian exile who's writing what they call a fictional royal autobiography. They say, well, in the ancient Near East, you know, in this post-exilic period, you would have this genre of literature in places like Phoenicia or, you know, Egypt, these different places. It was a fictional royal autobiography, and that's, that's what's happening here, and it doesn't matter if it was Solomon. But the problem with that idea <clears throat> is that if the teacher is not Solomon, if he's just some guy doing a thought experiment or speaking from his own theoretical philosophy, then his findings can't be deemed conclusive, authoritative, or trustworthy, right? Uh, let me ask you this. Do you want a real pilot who went to flight school or a pilot who just says, well, I'm speaking as someone who went to flight school, right? I mean, if you're, if you're talking about the trajectory of your life and somebody who knows what's true and what's not true, what matters and what doesn't matter. I want the guy who really went to flight school, who really knows what he's doing, uh, who can speak with authority. So here we see that he was king over all Israel. Now notice it wasn't a divided kingdom. And he says, and in Jerusalem. And so that alone narrows it down to just Solomon. It's a pretty short list. Not to mention the other clues in the book. Solomon speaks with credibility. As king, he had 
total ability, complete privilege, all the funds necessary to explore these questions to the fullest possible extent, and then some. So if there's anyone who had the time and the resources and the know-how and the freedom and the capability to get to the bottom of the questions of life, the questions of purpose and meaning and fulfillment, this was the one guy in human history who really could go the distance. Verse 13, I applied my mind to examine and explore through wisdom all that is done under heaven. God has given people this miserable task (laughs) to keep them occupied. Tell me how you really feel. Twice tonight, the teacher will explain that he applied his mind in these pursuits. Now, your version may say heart instead of mind. Hebrew linguists will tell us that the phrase is, I gave my heart or I gave my whole self to finding these answers, to finding the meaning of life. And so it wasn't just a weekend whim. It wasn't like one of those scenes in, you know, a movie or a play or something where the spoiled rich prince shows up to the battle in his armor, but his armor has no dings, has no scratches, has no blood on it. It's pristine. It's never actually been in a battle. It's always been near a battle. And you know that that guy's not going to do any real fighting. Uh, But that's not Solomon here. I mean, he is, as we saw in our very first study, when this guy walked into the room, you immediately thought, man, this guy has seen some things. He's done some things. He knows some things. Uh, And so we see here the teacher was disciplined and purposeful. He was deliberate. He's not dabbling, right? Uh, he, he was really applying himself and giving his whole heart, his whole self to this pursuit. He said he was going to examine and explore wisdom, which here could be defined as the art of success. Okay, it's, he, it, the Bible here is using a very broad term for wisdom. And he, and he did this more than anyone who came before him or anyone who came after him. But we see that his study left him absolutely frustrated and miserable and unfulfilled. He described all of his intellectual pursuits as miserable tasks that felt like heavy bags God put on human beings to weigh us down so we can spin the clock of our lives until we die. Wow, man. How could the Solomon of Proverbs say such a thing about wisdom? In Proverbs 3, He said, happy is the man who finds wisdom. So is this a contradiction? What's happening here? It's because the wisdom of Proverbs 3.13 is not the wisdom of Ecclesiastes 1.13. They're completely different wisdoms. Notice the wisdom here is the wisdom that is under heaven. Philip Ryken writes, the kind of wisdom the preacher had in mind was not divine wisdom, but human wisdom, the very best that human beings have ever thought or said, But the question is, how far will such wisdom take us? Will it lead us in the way of life everlasting? Will it help us understand why everything matters? And the teacher is going to show us in passage after passage that wisdom under heaven, under the sun, cannot show us those ultimate things. The, the, the teacher finally realized that the answer is no. Will it help, help me understand why everything matters? Will it put my life in eternal perspective? Will it lead me in the way of life everlasting? The answer is no. Human wisdom. Remember, under the sun, under heaven, that's the code that we're given in this book to understand the scope of the teacher's study. He wanted to understand the meaning of life. He wanted to get his hands on meaningful success, fulfillment, achieving the the personal purposes that would make life worth living. But his mistake was made in the very first step because he gave his heart to self, right? Self-fulfillment, self-understanding, self-actualization, self-determination, self-purpose. He said, I'm going to figure out how I can navigate my own life in such a way that I lay hold of purpose and meaning and ultimate satisfaction in life. And that very first step out the door was the mistake that he made. Because the problem is, you and I as human beings are not made for self. Your life is not made for you. You're the, the person that you are. God didn't create you just for you. You were made for God's purposes. You belong to him. He bought you. 
So not only did he make you and fashion you in, in your mother's womb, he bought you with the blood of his son. And when a human being divorces themselves from God's purposes, ultimate purposes for their lives, then the result is what the teacher says here. All my wisdom and exploration was a miserable frustration, a lousy job, a hopeless task. And remember, this is not some laborer in the quarry. This is the king of Israel, maybe the richest man to ever live with all of the freedom and all of the access and all the things that any person could ever want and then some. And he says, it was all miserable. Everything that I tried to do. Now, the other psalmist, Solomon has a couple psalms in, in the book of Psalms, but the other psalmists, they may not have been in, as intelligent as Solomon, uh, you know, as filled with human wisdom as he was, but they understood how to find the fulfillment we all long for. In Psalm 84, verse 5, we hear this really beautiful verse, happy are the people, okay, we're paying attention, happy are the people whose strength is in the living God, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. And so you already have this division, right? So the teacher says, I'm going to give my whole self, I'm going to set my heart to the the greatest application of human knowledge, wisdom, and understanding, and ingenuity, and ingenious that anyone has ever achieved or ever will achieve. And in the end, it's, it's Hevel. And then you, you turn to these other passages, people who, yeah, they didn't weren't as smart, they didn't accomplish as much on the human plane as Solomon did, but they said, well, we know how to be happy. I don't set my heart toward self and toward, toward me laying hold of satisfaction. I give my heart to following after God. I set my heart on pilgrimage and I put my strength and I put my attention and I put my affection on the living God. Because God made us. He bought us. He loves us. He has purposes for us to discover and walk in. And when we walk with him, and, and fulfill his purposes, or rather as he fulfills his purposes in us by his strength and his goodness, then we discover that life is full of fruitful multiplication, right? That's what he said originally to, to Adam and Eve. He's like, what I want for you as you walk with me and we have this relationship and I accomplish my plan through your lives, I created you for a purpose and here's the purpose, you're going to do a bunch of different stuff. Day to day, all sorts of different things, but in general, what your life is going to be about is being fruitful and multiplying, fruitful multiplication. And yet, what do we see Solomon? He says, it's frustrating misery. And we see there's such a difference between these two ways of life. Now, when we wander away from God, even as Christians, as well, Solomon wasn't a Christian. He was a believer, right? He's before Jesus Christ came to earth. But Solomon started off as a believer, and we know that he wandered away from God by the end of his life. So when we wander away from God and reduce our lives to those, um, those things, those pursuits, those attitudes that are under the sun, then no matter what we do, in the end, it becomes a frustrated, miserable task. And that's the bottom line of the teacher's many experiments. Verse 14, I've seen all the things that are done under the sun and have found everything to be futile, a pursuit of the wind. And so again, we're only a few studies into this, but man, the teacher keeps doubling down. It's just hevel. It's the pursuit of the wind. It, 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 it is this, this smoke that dissipates out of our hands and we can't lay hold of it. And it won't be the last time he says it. I mean, he keeps saying it over and over and over again in every chapter that, that life under the sun, apart from a personal relationship with God, he says it's hevel. Even when it's good, it's gone after a moment. When it's bad, it's frustrating, it's toxic, it's just hevel. All of these things are happening and you can't lay hold of it because that's what life is like apart from God under the sun. And he knows that, that people have a hard time listening to this message, right? But we see here, he's run the numbers. He, he has run the experiment from beginning to end again and again. And he knows that human beings, we are not going to make it apart from God. Do you remember in Apollo 13, they're arguing about this and that on the spacecraft and, you know, they've had their accident or whatever. And finally, one of the mathematician guys says, hey, I ran the numbers. They have no oxygen after this time. So all of your theories about how to make the spacecraft move and how to get it around the moon or get it back to where he's like, none of that's going to matter. They'll all be dead because there's no oxygen, 
right? And it's like, hey, we ran the numbers. That's it. And, and then everything has to change because it says, well, they're not going to make it. So we can't argue over how to make the thrusters work if all of the astronauts aboard are dead and can't operate the thrusters. And so that's the idea. The teacher's like, we're not going to make it. You're apart from God. You're not living out your purpose. You don't understand the communion you're supposed to have with the God who made you. You're not going to make it. And we sense his exasperation in these verses because he knows that the average human being doesn't want to believe what he has discovered. But he looks us in the eyes and he says, I've been to the end of the road. I've gone further than you could ever hope to go. Everything you're trying to do apart from a relationship with God is like trying to be a shepherd over a flock of wind. Give it a try. It's just not going to work. Verse 15, what's crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. This is the first of two little proverbs the teacher is going to share with us tonight. This first proverb points out two harsh realities in life. First, what is crooked cannot be straightened. And what he means is, under the sun, some problems will never be solved. We will never build a utopia. We will never figure out how to make everything right. There will never be a human government totally free from corruption. There will never be a human society with total fairness and equality. There will always be deficits and potholes, no matter what. You know, whether it's a, a small problem or a really major problem, this is the lot of humanity. Why? Because of Genesis 3. Because Adam and Eve, who were given this purpose and given this life and given this way to walk, they said, okay, we could do that or... What if we went this other way? Has God really said? Did God really tell us the truth? Why don't we take, take you know, control of our lives out of God's hands and try to have it ourselves? And immediately they ushered in you know, sin, sorrow, and death. And now all of creation has been ruined by sin and is giving birth to death all the time. And so this is the reality. What is crooked cannot be straightened, not ultimately by humanity. It's always going to be deficits, corruption, potholes. And then the second part of this proverb is, what is lacking cannot be counted. One of the reasons why mankind can't ultimately solve every problem or even solve most problems is because we are always working with insufficient information. We are finite beings. We're not, you know, omnipotent. We're not all-knowing. We think we know everything, but we don't. And so we're always working with insufficient information. There's always something we don't know, something we didn't anticipate, something that defies human logic and therefore breaks the thing that we're trying to get put back together. My favorite example that epitomizes this proverb is what is called the cobra effect. Is anyone familiar with the cobra effect? Okay, this is my favorite thing. When the British ruled India, they were really concerned about the number of venomous cobras in Delhi. And so the government offered a bounty for every dead cobra. Bring in a dead cobra, we will give you money. That should, you know, lead to the eradication of cobras and, and the problem solved, right? It seems like that's just a fantastic use of tax dollars and a fantastic use of everybody's time. What happened? it led to an explosion of cobra breeding in the city. Because if you're saying you'll pay me for dead cobras, what's the best thing that I could possibly do? Breed cobras. <laughs> do I want to go out in the jungle and find one cobra and maybe get bit trying to catch him and killing him and then bringing it somewhere? Or what if I just had a whole you know, area full of cobras that kept making more cobras and I just take them like a harvest all the time? Well, that's exactly what happened. It, it led to an explosion of the breeding of cobras. Okay, that, that problem got a little bit worse. But then the government, the British government, figured out what they were doing, and they said, all right, we're no longer paying for dead cobras. Uh, well, if you're no longer being paid for dead cobras, do you want a bunch of venomous cobras at your house? I don't. So do you know what a bunch of those farmers did? Let the cobras go. And so in the end... There was a huge surplus increase in the wild cobra population. <laughs> after all this money and after all this time and after all of these smart people got together in a room and said, here's how we solve this problem. And you fast forward and the problem is much worse. And a bunch of money has been wasted. And probably a bunch of people got bit learning to farm cobras, right? It's Hevel. That's exactly what Solomon is talking about in this book. 
Uh, And it's exactly epitomized in that verse, verse 15. In verse 16, he said, I said to myself, see, I've amassed wisdom far beyond all those who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has thoroughly grasped wisdom and knowledge. Okay, this isn't a brag. It's simply a statement of fact. And remember, he's, he's kind of opening the books here of all of his laboratory experiments, and he's showing us his methodology. Now, we're talking about the GOAT when it comes to knowledge and understanding and intelligence. There's never been a human being on planet Earth who was smarter than Solomon. No offense to everybody here, right? (laughs) Solomon was smarter than all of us. But the teacher here, he's showing us that he's a very careful researcher, right? Because he really wants us to believe him. He really wants us to know that what he's telling us is the truth that he has run the experiment with his life so that you don't have to ruin yours. And he says, I'm I'm a careful researcher. He said, okay, here's the problem I want to solve. What's the meaning of life? How do I really find fulfillment in this world that's full of time, death, and chance? And so he says, okay, I'm going to plan and I'm going to assess everything that I'm seeing and I'm going to take careful notice of all of these different things and I'm going to evaluate my own methods. I'm going to audit myself continually to make sure that I'm doing this right. He's not some absent-minded professor. He's fully aware of everything going on and his part in it. And after his initial failure in verses 13 through 15, that's kind of the image we're seeing here, he he goes back to the drawing board. So verse 15, we kind of see he comes to the end of a part of the experiment. He says, well, that didn't work. And so he goes back to the lab for verses 16 through 18. He's back to the drawing board. and He says, oh, I'm going to start again. Let me check my methods again. Let me check my tools again. Let me recalibrate. Let me make sure I'm getting true results and that the problem isn't in me or in my methods. Verse 17, I applied my mind to know wisdom and knowledge, madness and folly. I learned that this too is a pursuit of the wind. So he started with pursuing earthly wisdom, but the results weren't what he hoped for or what he expected. So he said, all right, sometimes you can know a thing by understanding the opposite. So he said, why don't I go to all the way to the other side? And since my pursuit of human wisdom left me miserable, maybe I'll find peace and happiness and fulfillment at the opposite end in madness and folly. And we'll see all these different avenues that the teacher took along the spectrum. Uh, There's a whole bunch of them that we're going to get into from being just all I care about is pleasure to, uh, okay, I'm going to care about philanthropy or I'm going to care about science. I'm going to care about this. I'm going to care about that. He goes down all these different avenues, all along sort of the spectrum of wisdom to madness. But no matter where he went, we'll see all of them left him with Hevel only. They were all a dead end that ended in smoke. And and that's the point he's going to make in passage after passage. In his quest for purpose, for fulfillment, to discover the meaning of life, the teacher was willing to go a lot of places on our behalf. But we notice here, as he, as he gives us the abstract up front, where didn't he go? Well, he didn't go to prayer the way Nehemiah did when he stood before the king. He didn't go to praise like his father David did in his times of struggle or frustration or danger. He didn't go to God's word the way the other psalmists did. You know, you look at Psalm 119 and, and it's like, hey, man, I just need to go to the word, go to the word, go to the word. He went down human avenue after human avenue after human avenue, each of which made great promises to him, but ultimately left the teacher only a big wisp of hevel. And so he was left trying to shepherd smoke no matter what he tried. Verse 18, for with much wisdom is much sorrow. As knowledge increases, grief increases. Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell wrote this. We have found that the men who know the most are the most gloomy. And and that comes from a paper they wrote with a bunch of other scientists and intellectuals. And and the point of that paper, uh, it's called the the Russell-Einstein Manifesto. And the point of that paper was to convince the world leaders to save humanity from nuclear war. They were convinced, they were like, hey man, we're going to destroy ourselves with these nuclear bombs. This is our manifesto. We want to save the world from this problem. We want to, you know, sustain life. Listen to what we're saying here. And their big answer was this line. Remember your humanity and forget the rest. Okay. Uh, Pause. I know you guys are smart guys, but I've been thinking about humanity for about, I don't know, 90 seconds. 
And it doesn't matter. Do a 90-second study of humanity from the perspective of history or sociology or anthropology or just your personal experience, and you're going to show that that answer, remember your humanity and forget the rest, is completely empty. That's just total hevel. Humanity, from every perspective, is defined by selfishness, by violence, by greed, by opportunism, by jealousy, by stubbornness. Humanity is obviously never going to renounce war on its own, which is what they said. Hey, humanity just needs to renounce war. Yeah, remember when we fought World War I? That was the war to end all wars. And World War II said, oh, I'll show you something. <laughs> to, well, why, don't we, why don't we make this worse by like a factor of 10? And now we're hearing people talk openly about, well, maybe World War III is going to come. You know, we, humanity is never going to renounce war on its own. Humanity not only has to have laws dictating what is acceptable in human society, we also have to have people who enforce those laws with guns and violence because there are so many people who say, I don't want to obey the laws, right? So this idea that, well, just remember your humanity and then we'll all just be in a big campfire circle singing Kumbaya and everything will be great, that's obviously not true from any perspective, in any society, in any generation for thousands of years. What a stupid thing for smart people to say, right? But they didn't have any other answers because those guys weren't going to appeal to the God of the Bible who alone can solve these problems. So the teacher is the wisest person to ever live, at least when it comes to wisdom under the sun. But that wisdom is not enough. And that's his whole point. He says, I am the guy. I'm the greatest of all time when it comes to wisdom. And I'm telling you, not only is wisdom not enough, wisdom under the sun is going to leave you empty and miserable just trying to shepherd the wind. Now, what's interesting about that is that then the Bible comes along, God comes along, and he says, yeah, that's right. Human wisdom is, is not going to make it. In fact, it is so inferior that one day it's going to be destroyed. Listen to what Paul said in 1 Corinthians. Paul quotes Isaiah where God says this, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will set aside the intelligence of the intelligent. He says, that's right. Human wisdom is not enough. Human genius is not enough. Human plans and human care for things, human philosophy, it is not enough. And it is so inferior that one day it's going to com be completely done away with. What we need is something better than wisdom under the sun. And so God offers his wisdom instead. And in the New Testament, we discover that God's wisdom is Jesus Christ. Paul, continuing in 1 Corinthians 1, Yet to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God, because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. You see, the teacher was trying to carry a load that was just absolutely too heavy for him. He's nowhere near strong enough to lift this burden of finding the meaning of life, of ultimate purpose, of true fulfillment, of making sense of the fallen world around him. It's too much. It's too heavy. And in fact, it's bolted to the bedrock of the earth. You can't lift it. All of his efforts are like herding cats, shepherding smoke. And he realized it was meaningless, miserable, a hopeless task. And then God comes along who knows you and loves you and has purposes for you. And he says, you don't need to shepherd the wind. Why don't you let me shepherd you? Why don't you become a sheep in my flock? And when we are shepherded by God and follow after him, he not only leads us into the purposes he's designed for us, but also to contentment and fulfillment, green pastures and still waters. And along the way, he straightens what is crooked for us. Check this out. Psalm 5, verse 8. Lord, lead me in your righteousness because of my adversaries. Make your way straight before me. So in the world, we have these crooked things that cannot be straightened with human wisdom. And then God says, hey, here's what I want to do. I want to reveal to you the purpose and meaning for your life that I have handcrafted. And as you walk with me toward those things, I'm going to give you fulfillment. I'm going to give you contentment. I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you strength. And I'm going to make the crooked things straight for you. God does what can't be done. Solomon says, hey, these crooked things, they can't be made straight. It's impossible. And he knows what he's talking about. And then the Lord comes along and he says, I'll do what can't be done. 
I can do the impossible on your behalf if you'll allow me to. Hebrews 12 tells that as we submit to the Father, our tired hands and weakened knees are strengthened and that our paths are straightened for our feet. He doesn't weigh us down with misery. He says, take my yoke on you. My burden's light. That yoke is easy. I'm going to carry the heavy end of it for you. Instead of being a frustrating misery, life becomes full of fruitful multiplication. Yes, there are still difficulties, still hardships, still suffering, still things that don't make total sense to us and maybe never will, but we know that we are communing and living and walking with a God who gives beauty for ashes, who gives joy for mourning, who gives firmness instead of hevel. Real purpose, real meaning, real fulfillment found only in Jesus Christ, but found readily in Jesus Christ, who offers us life everlasting, life more abundantly, a life full of holy delight, glory, and joy. I came across this interesting website and article this week. It's called livinginhawaii.com. I, I, I couldn't believe what I was reading and how, how I was just like, man, I think you need to send a royalty check to Ecclesiastes because you, you are plagiarizing the teacher, right? This fellow, he's been living in Hawaii since the 80s, and he now, I mean, he, this is his website. He now defines himself by challenging others to go and live there too. His about page says, I've been living the dream. Are you ready to live the dream? Now, on his website, he had a pretty eye-catching article, and here was the title. What is the meaning of life? Fun, God, money? And I just want to read you some of the things that he wrote in light of this, this discussion. He said, I guess I'm on a quest for the meaning of life. I'm 42 and it's time I figured it all out. I'm giving myself until December this year and then I've got to have the answer. Okay. I said in the past that fun is the entire meaning of life, but having fun most of your life doesn't prepare you for the future at all. Some people live their lives for God. Whatever God they choose is irrelevant. Gods have nothing to do with the meaning of life except that if they created the world and gave me life, they must have had some idea for human beings in mind. They must have had some sort of point to creating us. They must have had some idea about how our time living could be best spent. What affects me is the nagging question about why I'm going through this life as I am. What is the point of me going through this life? For myself, I found various meanings of life. Some last me one or two years. Just pause and, and reflect on that. The meaning of life, some last me one year, some 10 years. Right now, I'm more interested in the ultimate meaning of life, one that might be shared by everyone. Is there such a thing? And he has this other section. And he says, you know, there's a lot of different meanings of life. And he literally says this. I'm sorry if you're scandalized by this, but he says, my meaning of life could be carving wooden phalluses for, for travelers in Hawaii, while your meaning of life might be saving children from slavery in Asia. <laughs> and he's absolutely serious. And he, he sums it all up here. He says, the meaning of life is living in Hawaii with family and friends. That's it. Okay, I wonder what someone living through the Lahaina fires on Maui thinks about that, right? Uh, yeah, everybody loves living in Maui until the Lahaina fire comes. Uh, or I wonder why Hawaii has a higher suicide rate than 26 other states in the USA. Or why on average 12 people move out of Hawaii every single day. Because it's obvious that there has to be more than sun and sand. There is. It's life in Christ, a life offered to anyone, anywhere, a life offered to this guy. He's so close. It's this guy. It's like, man, you're not far from the kingdom. There must be a God. He must have purpose. Oh, that doesn't matter. I guess I'll, well, I'll, I'll change my meaning of life. How long has it been? A year? I guess I'll try this. That didn't work. He's saying, I'll try. fun is the meaning of life. That didn't work. I'll try this. Well, that didn't work. What a sad thing. And meanwhile, Christ is there and he says, I I'm the meaning and I have a meaning for you. I created you specifically from before the foundations of the earth. I knew you. I loved you. I had uh, in thoughts and intents and plans for you. I'm hoping so much that you will realize that I'm real and that I'm calling to you so that I can give to you all of these things that I have planned and intended for you. I've offered it to you, anyone, anywhere. And one, it's a life that we get to experience every single day, wherever we are, whether you're in Hawaii or not, as we walk with this Lord 
who says, I have the wisdom you need. I have the meaning you need. I have the fulfillment and the purpose you need. I have the life that you need. 